I think that wouldn't have been true even 10 years ago. Um, people who are close to her say that they feel that her personality really changed after Marty's death in 2010, and that in certain ways she kind of took on part of the affable, outgoing side of his personality. And although Privately, she's always been witty, like this public funniness is, is new and is sort of like borrowed from, you know, from her late husband's persona and that she's just sort of, you know, I think to me one of the, the coolest thing about her having this unexpected rock star status is the fact that she's 85, like that's not usually who we worship and it's just there's something great about that and I think she appreciates that too but you can see it in the film but I feel like we saw it more on a number of occasions in, in real life when she's surrounded by like adoring throngs who are like, it's like she's loving it. You see like a little, there's like a little smile on her face like she is very happy and all of the like tchotchkes that have come forth uh, to, uh, in honor of her, like she, we had a situation where there was a Getty photographer was taking a picture of Betsy and me and her in the middle, and she had a little bag uh, in front of her, and somebody, like, one of the PR people came and like, oh, there's like a purse here, and she's like, no, that's my eye descent bag, and there was, I'm sure, there was this little eye descent bag with her face on it, and she wanted to be in the picture, right? she, she's, in, she's just into the whole thing. <laughs> So, so that brings me to one final question before I open it up to what I'm sure will be many great questions in the room. Um, Sundance and Robert Redford and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> okay, so um, the Justice actually saw the film for the first time at its world premiere <laughs> in Sundance. Um, we hadn't shown her any rough cuts or anything previously from it, and um, she, we had been uh, wringing our hands a little bit about what we would do when she sort of made that request or, or demand because we weren't intending to do that. Betsy and I both have journalistic backgrounds where you just don't do that because that's opening the door to negotiating about what's in it. But to her credit, uh, she or no one in her office, nobody ever asked that question. She agreed to come out to Sundance um, not having seen it. Uh, sitting in a room of 550 people with <laughs> Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who we made a film about, was like incredibly nerve-wracking. Um, Betsy and I were right across the aisles. We were even smaller than this. We were right across the aisle, and we just like stared at her through the whole uh, hour and thirty-seven minutes. Um, but from the very beginning, um, you know, those first scenes of Washington with any of you who share her love of classical music will know that that's from the overture of the Barber of Seville, and. Um, she was sitting next to Nina Totenberg, and she turned to Nina, and we were close to her, so she said, ooh, I like the music. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is voting well. And then she just was like really engaged in it. She laughed repeatedly, both at things that other people said that were funny, but even at her own jokes she seemed to enjoy. Um, she, she cried a number of times, and um, she wasn't supposed to be part of the Q&A, um, but, um, you know, Supreme Court justices really aren't supposed to promote things, so it hadn't been planned that she's part of the Q&A, but someone in the audience asked, I wonder what Justice Ginsburg, she like popped right up. <laughs> <laughs> she walked in, and that was like the first question actually, so she walked down to the front of the stage, and she um, she proceeded to hold court, uh, as it were, for, for about 15 minutes. It was just totally amazing. Now, earlier in the day, she had done a moderated discussion with Nina Totenberg that Robert Redford made a surprise introduction for. Uh, Sundance told us a couple days in advance that, that Redford was probably going to do the intro, and it was me who made the strong case of, like, we can't tell just, the justice about this because in case he ends up canceling, I don't want her to remember Sundance as, like, the time that, like, Robert Redford didn't show up to introduce her, so, like, let's not even mention it. Um, we met up with her in the green room just before this event, and we were talking to her, and you know, Betsy and I are still quite intimidated by her, so when we come in, she's seated, we sort of come far forward to her, you know, she's little, so you sort of lean down, like justice, so good to see you, whatever, paying our respects, we have a little conversation, and then uh, Robert Redford decided he wanted to greet her before the event, too. The door cracks open, Robert Redford walks inside with no 
preparation or introduction. I assume she knew that Sundance was that, you know, Robert Redford was the guy, of course, but who knows? Like, it wasn't anything we discussed. He walks in the room. She just popped out of her chair, and she just walked over uh, to greet him, seemed really thrilled. When she was asked in um, our movie Q&A, what do you think of Sundance? Her response, this is pretty much verbatim, was, I think Park City is beautiful. It reminds me of Switzerland. And Robert Redford is very good looking. <laughs> Seems to hit, hit the nail on the head. Um, so should we go ahead, Martha, and open it up? Um, what do people want to know from, from Julie? Yeah? Who are the three people that she suggested that Yes, the three people that Justice suggested are all in the film. Um, in fact, they were among the first three we interviewed. Now, that, of the five people in our sort of initial go-ahead to interview, we interviewed all three of those. That was for strategic purposes. We wanted it to get back to her. Obviously, they were friends of hers, so we wanted her to know that people felt that we uh, did our homework, but we weren't necessarily going to include them in the film. However, all three were fantastic, so all of them um, were in the film. So um, two of them were two of the three characters from the ACLU Women's Rights Project. We I, ourselves had identified uh, the woman who was actually in the courtroom with her when she argued Frontiero, um, Brenda Feigen. But we had not suggest we had, we did not plan to interview, or we hadn't had on our initial list. And Justice Ginsburg added um, both Ari Nair and uh, Kathleen Paradis. Um, and the third, who was really one of our favorite characters in the film that I don't think we would have ever thought to interview because we knew that they served on the Court of Appeals together but wouldn't have known they were close friends, was um, Judge Harry Edwards, um, you know, who ended up just, you know, being so, so terrific and so both, you know, smart and adorable and had so many good stories, like the, some, some in the film and others that, that weren't about, you know, kind of like the combination of, you know, brilliance and, like, <laughs> prickliness that, that uh, char characterized her. He was very cute in his notorious RBG shirt. <laughs> All right, what, what, what else? Yeah? What do you attribute her success at beating cancer twice, um, aside from her um, workout with a trainer? Does she have other health um, methods at staying alive? <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, there's sort of a specific um, reason, you know, her second bout of cancer, which is pancreatic cancer, um, you know, often an extremely uh, serious uh, form of cancer. Um, in her case, because she was being screened aggressively following her first cancer, um, pancre her pancreatic cancer was found before it was symptomatic at all. Um, usually, by the time someone, someone is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, it's because they have symptoms and it's too late to operate. In her case, she was able to have surgery. Um, you know, she's actually, uh, she's not like a health food person. She's a big and healthy eater, surprisingly, for her tininess. Um, she likes to drink wine. Uh, and, you know, I attribute her health, I think there's a connection between her, her like, tough, determined optimism, you know, and her health. Not that that can fight everything, but just somebody who's going to take any bad thing that happens to them, whether it's a death in the family, uh, you know, irritating or horrendous discrimination, you know, or cancer, and is just gonna respond to anything like that with like, how am I getting up the next morning to like fight another day? Like it's a pretty, it's a pretty good life strategy. And I, I you know, I, I don't know if we, if I could give you a medical uh, connection to that, but it, it, it feels relevant to me. Yes. First I wanted to say that I think that our 37 movie, and anybody who watches it will become a better person, I think, just for watching that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> second, like, I mean, obviously you did your homework on her, but what's like, a, like an anecdote or a story that you will always take with you from doing the, you know, doing the movie yourself? Like, what's something that you didn't know beforehand that you, you know, was kind of an eye-opener for you about her? 
Yeah, um, you know, part of it is just that attitude towards life that I was just describing. Um, I think there was something really powerful about spending a bunch of time with her over about a year and a half period in the current day combined with watching and listening so much archival footage of, of her. Like to me, the listening to her voice back in the 70s, like at a time when women were really supposed to be a lot more deferential and where she wasn't starting out in a power position, like the, the level of toughness that she brought with her to those court arguments is like really sticks with me now. I still, I still like to me, like I, I, of course the stuff about the marriage is incredible and moving, but like to me the most moving part is sort of like her own, the, the way that she dealt with those kind of challenges and like even when the justices are being condescending to her, where she, how, how tough she is when she stands up for herself, it just like kind of makes me want to cry just, just hearing it every time. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the nice things about making documentaries versus sort of like straight out journalism is the ability to bring yourselves into it. Like, I, and this was something, you know, like that our whole team kind of felt. I mean, you know, we, a lot of these decisions were being made pretty jointly between me and Betsy and Carla Gutierrez, our, our editor, and um, you know, fortunately we were saw very eye to eye on what we wanted the tone to be and the extent, I mean, we did try to pull back, we wanted you to see how cool she was and we were happy to have their anecdotes about that, but we sort of tried to stay away from sound bites that were just sort of like out and out praise of like, oh, she's so great, she's so tough, like, you know, we'd rather just sort of show that happening, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a little hard to describe the process, but, um, you know, we put, put it together in, in bits, we had sort of some strong thoughts going in about wanting, uh, wanting to not shy away from the legal stuff, um, you know, it's more, it's, it's more detail on, you know, essentially equal protection clause cases than you're going to get in most uh, theatrical movies that you see. Uh, but um, we thought we could do it, which is why, we, I mean, there are actually really important cases that um, RBG was involved in early in her career that, we, the career that we don't even mention in the film, and that's because um, either we sort of had a standard for it, like we wanted, to, we wanted it to be a case that she actually argued before the Supreme Court, so we had that incredible audio because that felt like it brought it like an immediacy that made it work a lot better versus like actually her, one of her most important foundational cases, which is called Read Me Read, you can look it up, it might be in there. Um, uh, she wrote the brief, but she didn't argue it, so we're like, okay, that's out, and also the uh, plaintiff in that case had passed away. We're like, okay, we need a real person so that you get to know and feel like you know the story and we wanna hear that audio, and then it'll, hopefully it can be engaging even if it is secretly, uh, legal, so that was sort of a thought, and then we knew we wanted to kind of mix it up between the historic stuff and the current day stuff. We like never wanted the audiences to forget that we're talking about an 85-year-old woman, because that's kind of part of what we like about her. We didn't want it to be like, oh, this is her history, look, look how beautiful she was, and everything was so great, and you know, and then like, in the last, you know, 25% uh, of the film have like, oh, look, and here she is now. Like, we always wanted it to be her now telling you what it was like uh, back then. Yes? I was a Columbia Law student at the time and actually worked with her on that Frontiero brief. And um, 
She was part of a, a clinical program at Columbia, and she also worked at Rutgers at the same time. So she was always bouncing about. But she was in an environment of tremendous hope and aspiration because the other uh, professors around her were also pathfinders. Uh, Riggs versus Duke Power came out of that clinical program. Uh, that's a Title VII case. And um, she was uh, someone who uh, I, I helped write part of Frontiero. She was somebody who you would give some work to, and out would come something so much better. Uh, she was a great writer. She was very shy, uh, as, as, as I'm sure you know. Uh, but when she did say things, uh, they were pointed and very well placed and very concerned and empathetic. Uh, she was uh, really something, and I was very privileged to have been able to work with her. Thank you. Really, really, really appreciate that. I, uh, I you, you, pathfinder, as you probably know, is a word that uh, the justice is a big fan of. So I appreciate you putting it uh, in that light, and it's really interesting and, and great for you to be here. Thank you very much. In the back. Julie, given that she was so driven, I was surprised.